it's a hombre holding up the bottle Look a little closer, cigar in Moscato An actor in improv coming from Chicago Alto, make way for Paul Vato Pablo, si hablo con mi tacos Not today, hasta luego, dale paseo Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, everyone. This is Paul Vato, and welcome to another episode of Paul Vato Presents, where my guest is Kate Lambert. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. So much fun. It really is. It really is. So welcome. Welcome to Fireside, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you. Thank you for taking Yes, everyone. Round of applause. For our guests, there are people in the audience. I hope that that's okay. You might hear some pause, clapping, some laughs, uh, some boos, maybe. I don't know. We'll see what I say. I, I like your attitude. Where should we start? Oh my gosh. Where, where do you want to start? What, what would you like to know? Would you mind telling people? where they might know you from, because I really want to delve into uh, the creation of your show that was on TV Land, Teachers, but also Second City. Who did I just interview? Uh, Jonathan Pitts, I believe, and he thought I'd already interviewed you. So I was like, I, I got to get Kate. If, if you know the people back from the Second City days in Chicago, if you studied there and things like that. Yeah, yeah maybe just a little yeah. bit about yourself and where people would know you from and things like that. Sure. Um, well, I was on a show uh, for three seasons called Teachers on TV Land, uh, where I played a character named Caroline Watson. And the really cool thing about the show was that it was formed based from an improv group called the Katie Dids, where we were all named Kate or Katie or Caitlin. And we had performed in Chicago and we started making videos in Chicago as a way to advertise for our shows. And the videos really started to catch on. So eventually we were approached by a casting director named Matt Miller, who is also a director in Chicago. And he said that he thought that we should work together on a web series about teachers. And so we all started to do that and basically decided that because we have like sort of an inappropriate sense of humor, we're like, okay, we need to, to have a probably elementary school kids so that we won't you know, permanently damage them and they won't really get it and the jokes will fly over their heads. So that's what we decided to do. And the web series just took off and then it wound up selling. We didn't even pitch it. TV Land saw it and offered to buy it. So we had that for three seasons, 50 episodes, and we were all writers, actors, and producers on it. Amazing, amazing. So about what year was this happening when when uh, you, you started doing the sketches online and things like that. Well, as you know, everything takes such a long time. I think we started shooting the web series. I want to say in 2012, we started working on it. We shot it, I think 2013. We sold it 2014. And then we started filming. We filmed the pilot the summer of 2014. We found out we got a series order like October of that year. And then we started filming in 2015 and then it didn't go to air until 2016. So it was like basically pretty sure like four years from creation to actually getting out there. Wow. That's, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a while, but that's just the nature of the beast. That is, that is Hollywood. And was everyone that was in, in cadence, were they also in the show then pretty much everyone that was in your improv group? also came over to the TV show? Yes. So there were six of us and everybody came over from the web series. Not all the same, obviously, actors we had from the web series because we shot the web series in Chicago. And by the time we shot the series, we were in Los Angeles. So we did have a lot of Chicago-based actors on the show, which was great. We were able to have a lot of super talented friends on. And that was really exciting and fun for us. But yeah, it... it we couldn't believe it. That was the thing. We thought when they were going to buy the show that we would get replaced, you know, by really well-known actors or this or that. And when they said, no, we want you guys to star in it, we, we like could not believe our luck. That, wow, that is amazing because you're right. It's great though that you guys like, you know, were ready for that. 
but I'm glad it didn't happen because that's usually when they end up maybe ruining shows where they've taken your great idea and maybe your first few episodes and then they run with it and then, you know, it just isn't what it used to be. So that is amazing. Did you start your improv studying at Second City or did you do Improv Olympic? Was it there at the time? Yeah, I did both. So I initially started at the Second City. I did improv for actors one and two. And then I auditioned and got into the conservatory. And I also did, they had a musical improv conservatory, which was really fun. And you learned how to improvise songs. And then I also did IO's improvisation program. And I did uh, Herald teams and a resident team at IO. And then I finally got, this was actually funny enough. This was the first job I had at the Second City. This poster behind me was from a cruise ship. I did. I got cast um, about four years after I started doing improv. I got cast on a cruise ship and I did that for about four months. And that was my first job. And then after that, I came back. I got hired to be an understudy for the Second City's National Touring Company. And then I got put on the National Touring Company, which was a blast. Was that one of like the Green Co, Blue Co, Red Co uh, touring companies? Thank you for saying the best one first. I was on Green Co. <laughs> it's not really a competition, um, but I was on Green Co with just absolutely fantastic performers and people. And it really does make all the difference when you're traveling, like such close quarters and, you know, to the people that you're with really matter as much off stage as on. And I was so lucky because we really were like, a great like family it was wonderful that's uh, amazing and there's such great people that have come out of all those touring companies which traditionally once you've reached that level of the touring companies then really the next step is going to the etc stage at the second city and then maybe even the main stage and, it's, and then a lot of people go from that main stage to either you know saturday night live back in my day it was either saturday night live or mad tv so, but still to this day, I'm sure, you know, that's where people come to hire writers, uh, comedy show and any TV show really, that's a comedy show, uh, whether it's a sitcom or a talk show is probably going to be staffed with people from the second city or, you know, back then improv Olympic. So there's a rich history there of these touring companies besides the, the green co red co and blue co. They also have Gayco, which is, you know, the, the gay company and, and, uh, uh, what else? I always thought they should have a Brown Co, but then we formed Salsation. So they do have Brown Co. Oh, they do. Yeah, they do. Is it for, for Latinos or is it just called Brown Co? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's a diverse touring company. I'm not sure if they're like how everything's divided now. Cause I've been gone for so long. But like, I'm pretty sure there's still green co, red co, blue co. I mean, I would, would imagine that hasn't changed, but they did have brown co. Oh, okay. Well, good to know. Good, good to know. Uh, Rocksteady wants to know if they have Coco. So uh, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Maybe they'll add that <laughs> as well. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, the shows that I saw from teachers were hilarious because there's this, you know, you're inappropriate almost relationship with the kids in that, you know, you're worried about getting uh, a husband or bringing them in to talk about your yeah. relationship, which is like very inappropriate to have these kids like, no, you know, no, you shouldn't call him back or that's his, uh, I think I saw the one uh, maybe from your reel where it's his new girlfriend comes to teach at the school and <laughs> the kids recognize her from the photos. Right. Yes. And that's when we play the friends are more than friends game where I'm going through his photo photos on Facebook and be like, do they look like friends or more than friends? Yeah, we liked doing that uh, with the kids because it was really funny because when you think about it, we always thought our teachers growing up were like super old. A lot of them are very young people and and, uh, you know, the majority of teachers in general are women. And so it was like, you know, I just remember when I was 24, was I like in any place to be molding the youth of America? I was not. So we kind of wanted to put 
people who really had not necessarily the best handle on their lives in a position and sort of show that sometimes the kids were the ones who were like, hey, you know what? Like, honestly, he does not like you that much. And we wanted them to be the reasonable people, the the audience, if you will, sort of being like, you maybe just like pump the brakes here. And so that's what we really got a lot of enjoyment out of doing the show. It's such a, such a great concept. Yeah, a round of applause for Kate. Uh, that is such, such, such a great concept that, uh, and, and, and very inappropriate for these kids to be involved in a 24-year-old's life like that. And it's true, though, because I remember that whole thing of seeing your teacher at a restaurant or, or at a store, and you're like, what is she doing here? Like, what, they have a life outside of school? Like, you just don't get it. <laughs> episode plot line like that where essentially like this kid could not comprehend that like why aren't you at school and yeah it is shocking to realize like they have a family they have lives and and especially when you get to be the age they are I mean I know when I was 20 I thought 30 year olds should have it figured out right but then you get to be 30 and you're like uh I do not know what I'm doing either so we did sort of like exploring our memories of elementary school and like, you know, the the sort of rites of passage that everyone has in elementary school with the Halloween parades and Valentine's Day, but also showing a twist on it of what actually happens in like, you know, the faculty lounge and what's happening with the teachers that you never saw. Now, when you guys were doing your improv shows, was that the framework? Was that you guys were teachers or were you guys were just improvising on all different topics? And then then when you started filming stuff, it was this concept came about. So basically what happened was I was in another improv well, sketch group at the time and we were filming sketches. And so what I suggested to the Katie did was I think we should start writing and filming sketches to promote our improv shows because, you know, we're sort of cu coming up in the community. We're trying to get hired. We're trying to get paid for our work, but we were not. And so I wanted to, to create something where if somebody maybe didn't know our comedy or didn't know our faces, they could see the video, you know, on their phone or from their computer and then be like, oh, these people are really funny and then maybe come to the show. So we started doing just random sketches to promote the shows. And then that sort of like, you know, it, it grew into doing maybe a little bit longer and that, that, that wasn't necessarily to promote a show. It was just for us to sort of showcase our comedic sensibilities. And then we were all the time improvising, but the improv was just straight improv. It was not us, you know, taking on characters or anything like that. But then when uh, Matt approached us about teachers, we just did the uh, the 24 webisodes as the teachers, but we were always just doing regular improv. Did a lot of those webisodes go then become the TV show episodes or what happened? How was that transition? You know, what was interesting was because we had six main characters, we realized after the web series that we really needed to blow the characters up even more and make them more different from one another. So we really had to exaggerate some personality traits and, um, you know, change things like that. We did wind up using, I mean, the characters themselves, you'll recognize them from the web series, but like the costumes are a lot more fi finer tuned and sharper. Um, you know, the makeup, like all the, you know, all the professional things that we then had access to that we were lucky enough to have with the web series as well, but we hadn't defined the characters enough yet, you know? So once we had made the characters like so much different, then I think that allowed like makeup artists like, Chelsea, Katie Colleton's character always had like glitter on and her hair was always like a new, like trendy, you know, thing, like, cause she was always trying to be young and hip. And so that was the thing that really like, you know, like made the big change from basically web series to show. But then a couple of the sketches got lifted. Like the friends are more than sketch, friends are more than friends sketch is in the web series and did make it to the TV show. Did you guys have any kids in your web series or was it just yeah. like fake kids in the audience, you know, in, in your classroom? No, we did. We had the, the, you know, what is so insane is that 
we did. And one of the kids who was in my class and friends are more than friends is now in college, which blows my mind because I'm even not sure how old she was, but we were essentially, she was playing a second grader and she's, she's in college now. Wow. Well, yeah, I, I guess, cause it would have, it would have started 10 years ago. Sure. So, so that makes, that yeah. makes perfect sense. But uh, now are you from Chicago or, yeah, I'm from, I'm actually from Virginia, but I moved to a suburb of Chicago when I was 13, like right before eighth grade. And actually the first show I saw when I moved was my parents took me to a second city main stage. Wow. That's amazing though, that your parents would, uh, would do that. Uh, do you remember the show? And uh, do you want to tell us like when a box was that? So, you know, it's, it's funny. I don't remember the specific show. Joe Ruffner, who worked at the Second City and I, like tried to pinpoint it. I think I might have seen Stephen Colbert when he was on the main stage, but it would have been 1994. So it would have been like the summer of 94. And then it continued to go throughout high school and college. So I saw like a lot of incredible people um, go through. I mean, I saw like Stephanie Weir, who I adored. And um, a really famous uh, sketch she does is called Yellow Ball. And I got to see that, like the original, which is just so cool. Um, but yeah, I'd always like go and see it. And I loved it. And I thought it was fantastic. And I'd always be like, well, I wish I was up there. But I never thought I would be like that. I didn't think it was even a possibility. And, and then I actually did get to go do the main stage for a while when Holly Laurent moved away and I took over for her for about four months. So it was crazy to have that experience. Like how long, 20 years later? Yes. Yeah. That was 94. It probably could have very well been like Stephen Colbert and, and maybe Amy Sedaris and Tim Meadows, Chris Farley. I mean, yeah, all those guys could have been there. Uh, yeah. Jim Zulovic. Um, I forget who was there at that time, Kevin Dorf, but I feel like those were Rachel Dratch were a little bit after that. Tina Fey, probably right after that, you know, but amazing to have seen all those people. Uh, it's funny you would mention Stephanie Weir because I, I took a friend of mine who eventually, and, and she was an attorney, professional, but just a brilliant mind, Was became the state's attorney out in the suburbs where I, I grew up in Aurora, Illinois. Huh? And I took her to see a show at the Improv Olympic and she picked out Stephanie Weir. She goes, she's going to be famous. And then sure enough, a few years later, you know, she gets on Matt TV. And then I would hang out with her when, when we were, uh, when she was on Matt TV, when I finally made it out to LA. But yes, yeah, Stephanie Weir, so crazy talented, uh, <laughs> along with her husband, Bob Dassey. Yeah, she was incredible. She was, yes. Her and Mo Collins were always two people I really admired. And I loved watching and, you know, Mo, um, I don't know if Mo worked at Second City, but I know she definitely did a lot of stuff at IO, but I just loved her too. Well, it's, it's funny you would mention Mo Collins. So, uh, so my friend who I, who I took to the Improv Olympic, um, she probably came out to see one of my shows, but then saw Stephanie Weir. And then uh, she and ended up going through the Second City writing program. So she ended up writing a show and I then, uh, she had a budget because, you know, because again, she was an attorney, so she had money. So she, we flew Mo Collins out for about a month to direct her show and then put it up uh, and, and put it, and, you know, she funded it herself and sold tickets. And I think she broke even, but it was a orange alert. I think we called the show. I, I forget, but Mo Collins came out and worked with the actors and I, I was used to be very close with Mo Collins during the Matt TV days. I, I met her when she was on Matt TV and, and I would hang out there. So yeah, she is brilliant. She's now on Fear of the Walking Dead, I think. Yeah, and we were actually lucky enough to have her on Teachers. She wound up playing Katie Colleton's mom. So it was so cool after so many years of admiring her to watch her work in person again. It was just so cool. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I, I, I love Mo. I miss Mo. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, it brings back a lot of memories from mid, you know, 2005, 2006, 
all, all those times. But yeah, she, she's a wonderful comedic actor. I'd love to have her on here as well, along with some of the other Mad TV folks. Yeah, for sure. Did you go to the Improv Olympic first or the Second City when you started your improv training? Second City first, and then and then I and then I moved over to IO because I I didn't want to um, exhaust myself too much. Like I was like, okay, I'm just going to concentrate on one place, and then I'll move to the other place because at the same time, you know, I was working a nine to five job and doing shows on top of it, and you know, the second city was like, I can't even remember. It was like a three or four hour class on a certain day. So I did IO afterwards and I loved both, you know, they're, they're both different. They have different goals, obviously, you know, second city wants to use improv to write ultimately. I mean, they also do improv obviously, but they're using it as a tool to write and IO is just improv. And so I did, uh, I was on a team that still exists there uh, as all a women team called uh, Virgin Daiquiri. And that was really fun to be on because we got to perform every week uh, and the show was free. So we always had an absolutely packed house. And, you know, I was with performing with um, female improvisers that I had gone through classes, like admiring and being like, I love this performer so much. And then it was like blew my mind that I got to perform with them. Uh, so it was just so much fun. Wow, uh, brilliant. And and forgive me, I, I know I keep calling it Improv Olympics. Oh, no, that's fine. But then the, for those that don't know, then the name changed to IO. <laughs> but it, it's hard. Old habits yeah. die hard. And uh, But yeah, IO. It was forced to change because of a copyright issue. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and, and I remember they, they couldn't even use, because you can't use the name Olympic. You know, because people get confused between the Olympics and Improv Olympics. So, yeah, that's exactly why they were forced to change to I.O. As Katie Cawson likes to say, I.O., rest in peace. Yeah. So. And, but, you know, I think I.O. is coming back. I believe so, because Rachel Mason might be in charge. Uh, yeah. At least I know that they've started coming back online. And, I, yes, so 100%, the I.O. is back. Yeah, and I'm not sure if they're in the same space or what, but I, you know, I haven't been to Chicago obviously in a long time, but I would love to go back and, you know, visit for sure. As would I. Uh, I remember visiting Chicago and and going by the new I.O. Uh, this was years ago, but I'd like to, you know, revisit uh, my old stomping grounds there, right across from Wrigley Field at uh, Clark and Addison was where I spent a lot of time learning improv and then doing improv. When were you there? Oh, you know what? I don't want to give away my age. Uh, no, it would have <laughs> been 1997, so the late 90s, 97, 98, 99. And then, because I moved to LA in 2000. Okay, got it. Uh, tell me a little bit about your family. Were they uh, supportive of your uh, choices to get into the world of improv. I'm sure now that now they would be, but back in the day, was that something that they were supportive or, you know, as far as classes went and things like that? Yeah, my parents, my dad's um, a surgeon and my mom was a nurse and a professor at the University of Virginia growing up, but they are also very artistic. Like my dad always played like guitar and now he takes uh, painting classes at UVA and my mom when we moved to Chicago went back to school and became an interior designer so they've always been very creative you know not just science oriented and my brother is actually a drummer so <laughs> they got a doctor and a nurse had a drummer and an actor but yeah they were always very supportive you know I was always into theater and plays, etc. My brother was super athletic. I was not. I was not a, a good athlete, but I loved to do shows. And when I was a theater major in college, I was really lucky because my parents never gave me a hard time about that. I think they knew, you know, it really made me happy and that's what I excelled at and really wanted to do. I think they also understand, you know, obviously after watching uh, their kid go through it, it can be really hard, 
you know, it's it's a hard business. And of course, it's a hard business. The music industry is as well. You know, any creative business like that is. But I think what my brother and I both really excelled at is creating opportunities for ourselves, which I think is one of the most important things you can do. You know, you cannot wait for somebody to give you an opportunity it, it because sometimes there are just so many people reaching for it that you just need to set yourself apart by creating your own. And then when you do that, you can essentially show someone your talents and what you have. That, yeah, bravo, bravo. And it's true, it's, it's that old adage of people are like, well, man, I'm just waiting for my ship to come in. And people are like, no, you gotta swim out to your ship. You know, it's not gonna just come in. And especially in the arts, music, uh, um, actors, you know, you're not just going to get a TV show <laughs> like you guys did, but you worked hard for it. You know, it was well deserved. Thank you. Yeah, we really worked hard. It, I think that, you know, it's it's important. Like there was a, a great quote that Steve Martin had, I think in his Born Standing Up book that was like, you have to be so good they can't ignore you. And I think that was the focus that we had when we were in Chicago is that we were like, okay. <laughs> We're doing all these shows for free and we are not getting paid. But even if we can't get our foot in the door as a paid actor at these theaters, then we are going to put our material online and showcase our brand of comedy and showcase what kind of characters we can play. And that way we'll get press and we'll get people resharing. And, and you know, it's going to, if they're not hiring us, that we're going to be showing up in their profile feed and they're going to have to see us either way. So that became our driving force and focus. Amazing. Well, you know, you kids had it so easy because back in my day, we didn't have Facebook and the Instagram and the YouTube to put up our videos, but that's it. You know, we also went out and kind of did our own thing. Like when I formed Salsation, I was one of the founding members of Salsation, which was a, a comedy with a Latin flavor because that wasn't being done. You know, so we went out there, we did, and we put up our own shows. And that's when we moved to LA, we had a show. And then because of that, we were able to get a manager and agents and things like that. So now it just, it's made it a little bit easier, but it's by no means easy. But at least, you know, there was that way where you, you took the motivation to put up all your material, put it out there. And then somebody came to you and said like, yeah, this is what we want. So that's, a great lesson for people, I think, to to take from this. Yeah, and I think too, sometimes with like especially the arts, it may be like seeing yourself as a business can kind of be like a gross word or whatever. But the thing is, is like it is, and you are kind of a walking business, and so you want to make sure that if someone needs to reach you, you know that you've got your materials online. You know, if I mean, I still have a website. I don't know if that's really showing my age or not. But, you know, you have your stuff together, you have a writing packet, you have your photos, professional photos, you have all these things so that so that you're really ready. And another thing I always thought was important was, you know, people that you work with, it, it's a huge word of mouth business. And, and, and that's a huge thing that happens because you know, we'll, we were on the casting side on teachers and we would be sitting there and be like, oh, you know, what would be great for this. We would recommend friends and people we had seen. And and that's why I think it's really important that even if you're doing a free job, you treat it like it's a paid one, because one day it will be. That is such, such great advice. Yeah. Round of applause, everyone. That is such great advice um, that you, and you should be enjoying it as well. But but you're right. You you can't go out there going like, well, I'm not getting paid, so I'm just gonna, you know, they're gonna get they're gonna get the, the their money's worth type of a thing. <laughs> I love the fact though that TV Land came to you guys and said we want this this web series. That's amazing. They and TV Land was such a fantastic place to go for us too because we had incredible executives there. The executive that really treated the show like his baby was named Brad Gardner and he was so unbelievable and they were so encouraging of our voice. I remember one of the first iterations of the pilot we had, they're like, you guys don't hold back. And I think they were right. We were, and they really wanted us to like 
you know, go completely at like we did in the web series to like, don't change us because it's TV, like do what you guys do and what you guys love best. Like we, we bought this show for your voice, not for you to alter your voice because, you know, now maybe you feel like you have to be a little bit more safe or something. And so that was like really fantastic because you hear horror stories about, you know, notes calls and things like that. And we just didn't have that. Like every time we would get notes, we'd be like, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's right. You know, and it was great. That's fantastic. It reminds me of a, I used to joke around with people like that when I, I tell them, like, I have a lot of notes for you. And all of a sudden their eyes get big. You're like, but they're all good. Then they're like, oh, okay, great. Thank you. But you're right. You don't see that often from networks, you know, because they always seem to want to put their touch on it. And, you know, well, you know, this is what we think should be happening. But then they totally ruin your voice. So that's great that they were so supportive and whatnot. We were so lucky and we're just, you know, we were always so appreciative. I mean, it was hilarious when we got on set the first time because we were used to like holding boom mics for ourselves and this and that. We're like, somebody else is holding the boom mic. And we were like losing our minds at like the, the set design was like incredible. It was just so hilarious because, you know, at any point in time with a lot of our videos, the web series was more professional, of course, but with a lot of our videos, you know, we were the crew and we would be you know doing the art and you know everything so it was yeah it was just beyond exciting how yeah how exciting is that how many people were in your group in your improv group six wonderful what a great balance and and i'm sorry did you say that did most of them then end up moving out to la or did some go like hey i can't i can't do this Everybody Everybody wound up moving. We wound up moving at different times. Katie O'Brien moved first, then Katie Colleton, and then everyone sort of trickled out after that. I I was doing the main stage show for Holly, and then I got another job immediately afterwards at Second City, so I was doing that. And then when we sold the pilot, I wound up having to leave that job early because, I mean, I, I moved from Chicago to Los Angeles in two weeks. So I left. It was crazy. I left a full apartment and so I didn't have like that closure, you know, like where you have that moment where you close the empty apartment. You're like, that's my chapter. I was like, no. So in my head for a long time, I was like, I like still live in Chicago, right? Did they, did they uh, bring you out? Did they put you up or did you have to put yourself up in LA? When I, when we came out for a meeting, they put us up, but when we chose to move out, um, you know, it was, it was our choice to come out and it wasn't really a question. Nobody, nobody was like, I think I'm just going to like stay in Chicago. Everyone was like, yeah, it's time. I mean, I personally felt like I had done, you know, just about everything in Chicago I had wanted to do. And I did feel like it was that time to move on anyway. Um, so yeah. So the, yeah, we basically all just hit the ground running and looked for apartments. Well, that's the beautiful thing, I think, about Chicago. And I'm glad that it still seems to be that way where you can really hone your craft in Chicago almost without repercussions. Because I, I know that if you move out to L.A. too early, a casting director sees you, you don't kill it. They're like, nah, I've, I've seen him do improv. They're not that good or whatever. Or, you know, no, nah, I've seen him audition. But now you hone your craft in Chicago and then you move to New York or you move to L.A., you kind of come correct. You come ready, you come with a show, you come with with some reels, you come with experience, I think, or you come with a one person show or with us like Touched by an Anglo, we came out with a show. And because we had that, that's again, in LA, that's what got us agents and managers and everything, so. Totally true. And, and the thing about like, what I love so much about IO especially is like, you know, especially that first floor, you could just walk in any night, uh, you know, uh, uh, and basically see it, first of all, a ton of people you know, but then watch a lot of comedy. And and that was what was so cool about it. I mean, I was doing shows, like so many shows throughout the week. I don't know how I did it now at the age I'm at now. It is something that it's like, I will suggest this to people in their early 20s because you can handle it then. And that is, yeah. I can't believe some of the stuff I did. And then I would like stay out and yeah. then go to work 
Like what? That is exhausting to me now. I, I, yes. I mean, a hundred percent. I looking back, I'm like, how did I do this? Because I used to own, I don't know if you remember Oberweiss Dairy, which yes. is a, so I used to own an Oberweiss Dairy in Geneva, Illinois. That was oh, my first yes. business. You know, I was 200 pounds when I bought it. I was 300 pounds when I sold it in 2000 to move to LA. But I, I'm like, this was the whole time that I was taking classes, putting up shows twice a week. You know, so I was in L in, in Chicago three times a week. I look back and I'm and we, and we were open from you know 6 a.m. till 10 p.m. Uh, every day. Uh, so it, these were some long hours. And the same thing, you know, then you, you go out for a drink afterwards and then head back home and then do it again the next day. Sometimes I would just sleep at the ice cream shop, but I did have a, a great staff. My mom ended up coming to work for me. So she, she would really, as you know, as I started putting up the show and then finally I'm like, my, my, my lease ran out and I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to renew uh, because I need to move. I need to move to LA. So that, that, Help me decide to sell everything and move to LA. But I don't know. I don't know how we did it, especially, you know, uh, I mean, uh, Ike Barinholtz has some really funny stories about doing shows till, and then you're out till two, three in the morning. And then he got caught like sleeping in a closet. He used to work for the city of Chicago for like their transportation department. And, yeah. and he went, meant to go take a nap, but he passed out. And I think he slept for like two or three hours. They couldn't find him. They finally found him sleeping in a closet. You know, I think that's what they were like. I would always fall asleep on public transportation. That's a big thing with me. First of all, I can fall asleep on any plane ever. And then, but also buses, trains. I fell asleep on the bus once and I went a mile past my stop and I made myself walk home as punishment. And I have also fallen asleep on the train and woken up at the end of the line. Like the very end of the line. <laughs> So yeah, it was just, it was so much fun, but yeah, it was exhausting. And I think back to like when when we got a midnight show and we were thrilled. If someone offered me a midnight show now, I'd be like, uh, I can't do that. No, oh, yeah, that's no, that's way. I sit in my chair like an old man at like 11 p.m. And that is where I am. I don't <laughs> do shows at midnight. <laughs> no. No, not at all. So my ice cream shop was in Geneva, Illinois, at the train station. So we had a lot of people. I met a lot of people that slept right through their stop and because we were the end of the line for that Chicago to Geneva, which went through like West Chicago and a wheat and ice cream and then all the way into Chicago. Geneva is so beautiful. I love it there. It was such a quaint little town, uh, antique -y. There were no major corporations there. We were all you know, small businesses from bookshops to antique shops. Geneva, Illinois, for those, not, not Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, or, or Geneva in Switzerland. This was a very Swedish town. I learned how to say, yo, Kieter, Paul, my name is Paul. Uh, we had a, that, a perpetual uh, ye old Christmas shop or ye old Santa shop, I forget, but it was Christmas year round. It was an amazing sure. town. Yeah. Where, what's what, what town did you grow up in, in 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 the Chicagoland area? So I moved to River Forest, which is right next to Oak Park. I went to Oak Park River Forest High School, which, for people who don't know, it's the Adventures in Babysitting High School. It's where they all go. They, they renamed it Hemingway High for the school, but it, it's our school. It's because our Ernest Hemingway went there. But it's it's basically it's in Oak Park, and it's about. Uh, a mile from the Chicago border, maybe? Yeah. I mean, that's uh, these are the first suburbs, but it's really, it's Chicago, pretty much. I mean, Oak yeah. Park and River well, it Park. It was great because, you know, I it had that sort of like ride your bike, suburban type thing. Uh, and then also could hop on a train or when I could drive, could just have a quick drive into the city. You're basically in Chicago, but in the very nice part of Chicago. It's, it's beautiful. I love it. So you move out to LA and now you're, you're working on this TV show. It's great though, that TV land seemed to be such great bosses for lack of a better word that they were so supportive. Uh, so how did, how did it end? And I don't know if you want to talk about this, 
was it just it gets canceled or do you guys run its course uh, what's that like because you know the end comes which is unfortunate we ended the show in a way that it seemed like it was the end of the series but at the time we didn't know it was going to be the end of the series and then when we found out it also did feel right obviously it's a little scary you know to find out like oh no like uh what am i going to do next year etc but i think we also felt like we had done 50 episodes like that is so many plot points and character development and exploration that you know, we felt like we had like really served the characters and, and shown growth. I mean, Chelsea wound up like deciding to have a baby. My character finally got her dream ending. Katie O'Brien's character got married. So it really did feel like we were leaving everybody in a great place. And so, so yes, the show we found out, I want to say, in the fall of 2018 and then that like the, the last season started airing in 2019 so we were able to tell viewers before this season aired this is the last season that's very respectful 50 episodes is mm -hmm. a heck of a run so congratulations yeah congratulations we we're really proud of it and a couple of the ladies and i are actually working on um new projects together and pitching, uh, you know, some new things. And so, you know, we're very uh, excited and it's it's fun to work together again because we do have a great shorthand. And while we have different senses of humor, they go together very well. I look forward to that. I would love to see what you have uh, planned for us. Uh, so then, You've worked on other shows, though, that, that maybe you didn't have a hand in creating. What are some other exciting shows that, that you've been a part of or that you've worked on? Well, one that I was so excited about, uh, I got to be on Reno 911 in two episodes when they came back. And that was just a blast. And uh, I got to meet Tom Lennon on Teachers. And he, coincidentally enough, went to my high school. We didn't know each other, but it's just so random. Um, he's just been so lovely and supportive. And so I got to do that show, which was just so exciting. Um, and then over the pandemic, you know, when kind of in the beginning where nobody was going out and everything was shut down, Second City did an online sketch show. And I did that uh, from my home with my family in Virginia. And my brother was my cinematographer and my father acted in it and my dog was in it. It was so much fun. It was just a blast to do that, you know, because I think the pandemic was so difficult in obviously so many ways, but to be able to do something creative like that and share it was really special for me just to, to feel like I was doing something creative and maybe helping someone laugh on a difficult day. And I also um, recently just got to do a show called Tab Time, which is on YouTube with Tabitha Brown, who is so wonderful. Um, so I got to appear as an actor on the show and I'm also voicing an animated character uh, for the entire second season. So I'm just so excited about that. Tabitha has such a big following. Is it a cooking show or is it a kid's show or is it a combination? And it's fantastic. Yeah, basically the writing on it is just so bright and funny. Like it's the kind of show that adults can watch. It's funny because when I posted about it, I had some of my adult friends write me and, and one of them, one of my friends from high school, Drea actually, actually said, I watch the show by myself. So it has really wonderful lessons, but it's legitimately very funny. And so I think it's something that, you know, you would be able to watch with kids and enjoy yourself as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I suggest that people watch anything that, that you're in. Uh, I, I saw the clip somewhere of you with with uh, Cedric, right? Or does it go by Cedric? Yeah, uh, from Reno. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, that was Reno. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and you play, I don't know if I, I don't want to necessarily give it away, but what you play... Karen, or you play a Karen type of character? 
Yes, although I will say the people on the interwebs have been calling me Karen say our Ian. Yeah, so yeah, that was fantastic. It was so much fun to do. And that was right before the pandemic started. I can't believe that we got through that. Wow, amazing. Uh, I'm friends with Wendy McClendon Covey uh, from, from Reno. She did one of our early web series, which we called The House Sitter, which was my ex-wife. She would house sit for you, but only if you were a famous celebrity. So Wendy was one of the first, this was 15 years ago on the YouTubes, uh, where before we knew how to monetize anything or, you know, and, and all that good stuff. But Wendy is such a brilliant improviser. As, as, so is everyone. I mean, uh, I, I ran into Thomas. Well, I first met Thomas, I, I guess on Reno a little bit, uh, but then at, at uh, Wendy's annual like Christmas party, like must've been 2018 or 19, no, 19. Uh, so Thomas was there. And then, I don't know, six months ago, eight months ago, I was having dinner uh, at this Greek restaurant on, in Larchmont Village. Is that what it's called? Larchmont yeah. Village in, in LA. Uh, and uh, I was just having dinner there with a friend, Julie Garnier. And all of a sudden he gets up and I look at him, I'm like, Thomas Lennon? He goes, yeah. So we just, we were still distancing. So maybe it was a little bit longer than that. And uh, so we just chatted. And I was like, oh, I go, I go, we brief, briefly met at Wendy's party. And he is such a nice guy and so talented. I'm glad that he was on your show. He was someone who I have loved since I was in high school. So when he came on our show, I was like so excited. Of course, I wore a high school shirt that day, uh, but I was so excited. And then he was just, as lovely as you hoped he would be, which was just so great. Cause it was like, this guy is the best. And I thought he was the best forever and I was right. So it was great to work with him. hundred percent. I would love to work with him. Uh, I did a few episodes of, of Reno uh, where it was almost like glorified background, but it was some of the funnest times working on that show. And I always, uh, I still would love to, you know, they've come back. I think they were nominated for an Emmy. So yeah, and I think, yeah, I think they were nominated, too, for their, their movie they did. I hope so, because that, yeah, there's just so, such a crazy, great, talented group of impro really improvisers. Yeah. I mean, all that was. It was amazing to watch them work, too, because, because I did a show with people I've worked with since, what, 2009? And it was amazing to watch people who had worked together for years and years and years the shorthand is just so great and, and and it was really fast too. the shooting i mean they knew exactly what they wanted it was just such a delightful set to be on i love it i've seen some of the behind the scenes and i love what they do which is kind of like let the camera run and they'll mm -hmm. improvise it, it might be quick but they'll improvise for like 10 15 20 minutes one scene and no one breaks character Ever, the scene keeps moving forward because of, of this improv background. And then from there, they can cut it any way they want and get some brilliant uh, acting. It's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, I love fantastic. it. Fantastic. It's really, it's really cool to, to witness. Wonderful. Wonderful. Anything else that's coming up? Anything that you can talk about besides your project with your group or is there anything that we should be looking out for? Well, Tab Time season two, I think it's gonna come out in October. And and like I said, I have two parts on that. Um, one I believe appears in every episode, um, although I am uh, an animated character. Um, but, and the, and the other one uh, will be, I'm not sure where it falls along, but I'm just so excited to see it. It's, it's just such an awesome show. So I'm really excited about that. And other than that, you know, I'm always, I'm on the old IG, so everyone can always find me there. What is your IG where people can come and follow you and support and all that? Okay, it's, and this is a part of it, it's Kate Lambert. So it's, it's Kate Lambert. It's Kate. So I-T-S, it's Kate Lambert. It's Kate Lambert. Uh, it's, it's, Somebody already had Kate Lambert and I had to get creative. There's another model whose name is Kate Lambert as well, I believe. There's a oh. British model. So, oh, yes, that's right. I, yep. So look at that. Two models with the name Kate Lambert. Oh, you clatterer. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Man, this has been so exciting. I don't know how much time you have because I could Joe Rogan this and go for hours talking to you, yeah. especially when it's about improv 
I, but I won't, I won't do that. You, you've been so kind to spend this time with us. Um, do you have any final thoughts, uh, anything that people should know? What can we leave people? Uh, and, and then anything that, you know, that, oh, I, I also like to ask if you have any Vegas stories, but if you have a Vegas story, great. If not, maybe just some final thoughts well, and things that you we always said if we found out the teachers went to series, we were going to go to Las Vegas. And we were like, okay, as soon as we find out that the show gets picked up, we're, wherever you are, you're dropping what you're doing and we're all immediately meeting and we're driving to Vegas. So it didn't work out quite that way. We did find out, but we think we had to wait like a day or so. And so we all are so excited. Cause you know, we've seen like Ocean's 11, we're like, we got it. We know how this works. And so we're in like sequined dresses. We rented a limo. We get dropped at the casino and it is like dead. As in like, it's all probably people over the age of 80 and like a tumble. <laughs> and it was like two bars. And so we were like, this is not what we imagined. And I mean, we still had a great time, but we were really thinking like we were going to come in, you know, like the Blasio or Bellagio or whatever, like fountain would be shooting. We'd have the time of our lives. And it was a lot more uh, quiet a uh, weekend. I'd hate to throw myself under the bus or downtown Las Vegas. Which casino were you that this happened at? I'm guessing it was on Fremont Street or off the strip somewhere. No, I actually don't even know, but I just will never forget the expectation we had. And it was like running into a cement wall. I don't remember. That's a sketch right there because yes, of course, the expectations, the glitter, the glitz, the uh, neon. Baby, yeah, no. Uh, 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 Magic Mike, <laughs> uh, uh, Channing Tatum, Tatum Channing, whatever his name is, you yeah, know, uh, yeah. dancing and then it's, like old people, like. That's exactly, there was an oxygen tank. We did see an oxygen tank, yes. And and that's what it was and we were like, okay. And that honestly just sort of, that really checks out. That, that works out and that's exactly how it should have been. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Well, I wish I'd have known you were coming out. I, I would have uh, shown you guys uh, an amazing time, but you know, it can still, it can still happen, so. Next time. Next time, next time, next time. Let's film something here. I, I was uh, somewhat a glorified extra in a movie called Last Vegas. No, I was, no, not in that. That I was in Last Vegas, uh, Lost Vegas, I think oh. it was called, with Morgan Friedman and Kevin Klein. Oh, I love him. Wow, what a great Basically, It was such a great movie, but they filmed it inside Binion's where my, where my uh, I almost said ice cream, where my cigar shop was. And uh, I basically played myself in, in my white suit with my 18 inch cigar. My wife was rolling uh, cigars and Robert De Niro came over to watch her roll cigars. And they sh we shot all this stuff. We didn't make it into the movie, uh, maybe in the background, but uh, it was kind of that same thing where they're expecting the glitz and glamor of Vegas. And then it's like downtown Las Vegas, you know, which has its charm, but it's also, you know, a little bit older. Yeah, totally. That was <laughs> great. It was great. We wouldn't have changed it for the world. We're like, this fits. Yeah. This, yeah, this tracks. Wonderful. <laughs> totally tracks. <laughs> Amazing. Well, Kate, uh, yes, any, any final thoughts for our audience? And uh, thank you. Well, I guess my final thought I, I think if, if there are people who are interested in acting or writing, I would just say, you know, create your own stuff and you know better than anyone, like what your voice is and that you should write and act for yourself. Because if you do that, you won't be pandering to people. And if you like it, there are other people out there that will like it too. And I would just, say that, like commit to projects you really believe in and you like and put your whole heart into it. And I really feel like, you know, that's the best way to go about it. Amazing. That is, that is, yeah, round of applause. That's such great advice. 
it is uh, so true all, all that so thank you for thank you for sharing that kate um from someone that's done it and i love the fact that you have this improv background and it just shows that you know from the stage from your creative mind to the big screen or you know to well to the tv but i mean that's uh that's amazing thank you thank you it was so nice to finally meet you I know, I know. Uh, yes, and this has been wonderful. I know that we've been missing each other a few times. And, and you know, normally, of course, I, I'm clean shaven, but I have a callback for the role of a <laughs> So thank you, Tiffany, for helping what me read. Great leg. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'm, I've been trying to look scruffy for this. Yeah, you've got <laughs> to. Pirate. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens, but uh, so forgive me. Normally, like I said, I like to be a little bit more clean cut when we do these interviews. But hey, this is uh, this is the actor's life. What are you gonna yes, do, right? So is. <laughs> <laughs> At least you don't have to shave, so that's good. No, no, I don't. You know, I guess and my hair is its normal color, so I'm sorry I didn't come with to you with anything extra or good like you did. I <laughs> you are perfect. I love it. My ask and my final thoughts would be anyone that's in the audience uh, and, and Kate, if you, if you guys could head on over to Apple podcasts and follow Paul Vato presents, watch it, listen to it. Uh, if you're on Spotify, you can watch the video replay once I put it back up. Uh, but just uh, leave us five stars, maybe leave us a review, especially on Apple podcast and then join our community on good pods. Uh, it's called Good Pods. If anyone wants, just DM me and I'll send you the link. Uh, Good Pods is a great way to listen to podcasts. And uh, the community there is great. It's kind of like Facebook where there's a feed. You see what people are watching and listening to. Uh, and then you can follow each other and all that good things. And that's Good Pods. It's, uh, I don't know, like the, the Goodreads for, for books. But this is for podcasts with recommendations and things like that. But just go to paulvato.com. And from there, you can follow all of our social media. And please also make sure you follow It's Kate Lambert on Instagram. <laughs> and if anything, at least watch your your reel, which I think is like on maybe on IMDb, uh, where people can watch some of your work. It's all hilarious. It's all so well done. All the stuff from teachers, from Reno 911. Uh, I didn't want to give it away what happened in Reno 911, but that is such a great twist and so funny that uh, I'm glad you, you must have had a great time filming that. They really, they really, really are. And I can't wait to, uh, I hope that you and I get to work together someday. I would be so excited. Let's write a show. I don't know. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yes, and. <laughs> Well, folks, thank you so much. Yes, a round of applause for It's Kate Lambert. Uh, thank you. Yes, yes. We can't end the show. It's it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. Kate, once again, thank you so much for your time, and I wish you the best of luck and continued success in the future. Thank you, Paul. You too. It's always meeting you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you, folks. Goodbye. Improv coming from Chicago, Alto, make way for Paul Vato, Pablo, si hablo con mi taco, not today, hasta luego, down on paseo, arms a block away, I gotta tell you about a time when I saw a say, copy a broke, like say what?